Well, we're delighted to have as our keynote speaker today the man who so skillfully led the team that served the Ronald Reagan White House. It's a testament to the confidence and wisdom of Ronald Reagan that he would ask the man who managed his primary opponent's presidential campaign to become his White House Chief of Staff. And it's a testament to Jim Baker's patriotism and to commitment to serving his country that he would accept the offer. Since that time, Jim Baker's service has set the standard of excellence at the highest levels of government. Every succeeding Chief of Staff and Cabinet Secretary has aspired to achieve the incredible success of Jim Baker. It may surprise you that Jim Baker hadn't planned to be active in the political arena. Early in his career, Jim adopted a rule handed down from his grandfather, and it later became the title of his second book, Work Hard, Study, and Keep Out of Politics. <laughs> that didn't last too long, at least the politics part, but two out of three is not bad. After President Reagan left office, the first appointment of George Bush 41 was to name Jim Baker as Secretary of State. And to that position, as to all others, he brought his unequaled skills as a strategist and negotiator. He helped to assemble the unprecedented Gulf War Coalition and to manage the peaceful end of the Cold War and the Soviet Union. Please join me in welcoming one of the most brilliant, skillful, and honorable men ever to serve at the pleasure of the President of the United States, James A. Baker III. Sure, Thank you all, thank you very much, and thank you, Fred, for that really overly generous uh, introduction. Thank you as well for the terrific job that you and others are doing at this library and for this library and at the Reagan Foundation and for the Reagan Foundation to preserve the memory of a man who embodied the very best of our national character. Reagan family members, friends, ladies and gentlemen, I miss Ronald Reagan. I miss that engaging smile that infected Americans with his generous nature and the optimistic belief that each of us can make the best of ourselves if we only dare to dream of a better future. I miss his dynamic blue eyes, the ones that twinkled when he saw the good in a tough situation or a cantankerous adversary, but that could also turn very steely as they did when he stared down tra striking traffic air controllers. I miss the ramrod erect stature of a man who stood tall in the face of wrong, like he did at Berlin's Brandenburg Gate when he said, General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. He even... Even as he battled darker forces in the world, he remained touched by what Abraham Lincoln once described as the better angels of our nature. To his ear, the mystic chords of memory were the unifying verses that Americans have sung about freedom and prosperity since the founding of this great land. And so as time goes by, as our national discourse grows more coarse, and more crude as increasingly harsh winds blow across the globe, and it seems that our leaders either won't or can't do the people's work at home, I miss him even more. Ronald Wilson Reagan came from the Midwest with a background as diverse as the country he loved. He studied economics at Eureka College he became a radio broadcaster, a labor leader, a corporate spokesman, and then governor of California. As he matured, he demonstrated the power of big ideas about taxes, about spending, about regulation, about national defense. He held those rock rib conservative principles very, very viscerally. They were indeed part of his DNA and he never, never wavered from them. But even more, he was a decent, humble, and graceful soul, 
a man who, as George H.W. Bush once said, paid attention to small kindnesses that also defined a good life. Some didn't like his policies, but it was impossible not to like the man himself. Along the way, President Reagan restored our economy as well as our national confidence. And he did so in the middle of what was then the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. People worried that Japan Inc. would lead the world into the 21st century, but not President Reagan. He knew better. We are not, as some would have us believe, he said, doomed to an inevitable decline. He said this at his first inaugural. We have every right, he said, to dream heroic dreams. With his leadership, we again dared to dream of our nation at its finest. President Reagan had an unrelenting faith in the American experiment and in the goodness of its people. And fortunately for our country, he had more than just the power of good ideas. He was a principled pragmatist with an uncanny ability to turn his words into actions. With both Republican and Democratic support, taxes were lowered, and later the tax code was totally reformed, by the way, in a revenue neutral way. Regulations were eliminated. The solvency of Social Security was protected by a compromise between Republicans and Democrats. The rate of growth of federal spending was at last reduced. These were historic accomplishments that led to an astounding 4.5% non-inflationary average annual economic growth during a seven-year period. Absolutely unbelievable. President Reagan also had an innate ability to dig down to the marrow of an issue. This was the Ronald Reagan, after all, who prophetically pronounced that freedom and democracy, he said, will leave Marxism and Leninism on the ash heap of history. And he was true, and he was right. With those 14 words, President Reagan echoed every American president since Harry Truman. Like them, he had to fight a Cold War that threatened mankind with nuclear annihilation. He forthrightly confronted the evil empire with stout words and an even stouter defense buildup. Some said that he was a simple man, a grade B movie actor who spoke, who spoke in empty aphorisms. Someone even called him an amiable dunce. His thoughtless rhetoric, they warned, would lead us right into World War III. Of course, all of those windbags were proven wrong, <laughs> and they were proven wrong again and again. While his, while his critics carped, President Reagan acted, and he transformed our nation and the world. As, really, as clearly as Ronald Reagan saw things, though, he also understood the complexities of reality. He knew that the Soviet Union was a threat to freedom and stability around the world. But he also recognized that even at the center of darkness, there are men and women dedicated to building a better world. So he developed a relationship with Gorbachev that became a model of diplomacy, one that reduced tensions between the two countries rather than heightening those tensions. Indeed, President Reagan changed how the rest of the world looked at us, just as he changed how we looked at ourselves. And if Ronald Reagan was an inspiring president, Nancy was the consummate first lady. She was the cherished apple of his eye, of course, as well as his ardent supporter and his protector. Their life together taught us all about the power of a kind and loving relationship. Theirs was, quite simply, a love affair to remember. So it would be wonderful indeed to see them on the South Lawn at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue once again, waving to reporters and photographers as they confidently strode from Marine One to the White House. 
hand in hand and smiling, always happy, always optimistic. But of course, as much as we might like to, we can't bring them back. But one thing we can do is remind our children and grandchildren that this country of ours can achieve greatness when someone like Ronald Reagan is in the White House. The lessons of President Reagan can give courage to Americans who struggle to make sense of today's politics based on the destructive belief that it is better to yell at each other over our differences than to work together to find solutions to our common problems. Those lessons can remind us that words do have consequences. President Reagan knew that. President Reagan said what he meant, and he meant what he said. And were he alive today, it is impossible to imagine him walking away from a red line that he himself had said. He understood the power of a president's words, and he knew that they must be husbanded and husbanded very carefully. The lessons of Ronald Reagan can teach us, I think, that the globalization of the world's economy is an opportunity, not a threat, for American workers and business people. As the president who struck the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, which of course was the precursor to NAFTA, President Reagan understood that though some sectors of the economy can be hurt by free trade, overall, free trade creates economic growth and of course, that's what creates jobs. But he also understood that free trade means even more than just economic prosperity. It promotes geostrategic stability as well. I recognize, President Reagan said in 1986, the inescapable conclusion that all of history has taught us, and that is the freer the flow of world trade the stronger the tides of human progress and peace among nations. He wanted to break down barriers, not erect them. There are many other lessons we can take from President Reagan that can guide us today. One of those is the importance of building and nurturing alliances as a way to guarantee our security and using humor rather than anger to diffuse tense moments focusing on uniting our countrymen and women and not dividing them, and understanding and appreciating the importance, the great importance of American leadership on the world stage. But most of all, we can learn from President Reagan's understanding of the system of governance that our forefathers established when they signed the Constitution. He understood that compromise is necessary in a democracy as large and as complex as ours. That in a democracy, no one person or side gets to make all of the decisions. Yes, President Reagan held convictions as strongly as anyone who has ever sat in the Oval Office, but he also knew something equally as important. He knew that we judge our presidents by what they get done for the American people. None of what he achieved would have happened had he not lived by his mantra, expressed to me many, many times in the Oval Office. Jimmy would say, I would rather get 80% of what I want than go over the cliff with my flag flying. Isn't that a refreshing thought today when every policy difference seems to descend into a partisan fight to the death? And so when you hear today's candidates or leaders say they want to carry President Reagan's mantle in the future. Remind me that, remind them that first and foremost, our 40th president was focused on accomplishments, accomplishments, not scoring debating points. Of course, we're here today, ladies and gentlemen, to celebrate his 170th birthday. The 170th birthday of a beautiful human being and one of the greatest American presidents of all time. He made our country stronger. He made our country more prosperous. And he made the world a safer place. Like each of us here today, I know, I miss him and I miss him deeply. I miss his confident optimism in the enduring quality of the American spirit. 
I miss his wise understanding of our nation's place in the world. I miss his immense dignity that he brought to the office of the presidency. And most of all, ladies and gentlemen, I miss his ability to get things done. I can see him in my mind's eye today as if he were right here with us. He's jovially cocking his head a bit with those brilliant blue eyes flashing and that genial smile on his kind face. He'd tell us to keep our focus on building that shining city on a hill. He would remind us like he did in the past when he said, there are no constraints on the human mind. There are no walls around the human spirit, no barriers to our progress except those that we erect ourselves. And he would encourage us to dream heroic dreams once again. Then he would take Nancy's hand in his, like he did so many times before, and he would look lovingly into her eyes. Life is one grand sweet song, he would tell her. So start the music. Happy birthday, Mr. President. We miss you. <laughs>